Um, well, I work at uh, Lego. I think I do, probably don't have to explain what we do. We uh, build stuff. Um, I recently started working there. Before that, I did my graduation project at Lego. And uh, my challenge was to um, integrate small devices with physical Lego play. And that was my challenge. And I did this at the University of Delft. And I studied design for interaction as an industrial designer. And from there on, I start working for Lego. And now I'm just at the department lead of uh, technology platform, which means that we are just uh, the engineering type. And we try to make Lego stuff that which involves technology of most often. And I'm based on the front end. And my job is to include smart devices. Well, what I'm going to tell in this presentation is more about how we use uh, prototyping. Of course, I cannot say a lot about what we're doing because most of it is quite secret. And if I do, it costs me personally a lot of money. So that's why I'm not doing it. And I'm going to try why we're using prototype and which kind of process we do. I'm going to talk about my graduation project because I'm actually allowed to talk about that. And I'll show you some really simple um, prototypes that we used uh, in the history of building new Lego things and to show how we actually use prototypes in order to come up with those new concepts. Well, but first, I want, before I want to start with that, I want to show you something. Maybe you know the Marshmallow Challenge? I'm not sure who knows it. And it's from Tim Wojek and you have to build, for the one that don't know it, you have to build a sour as large as possible with 20 sticks of spaghetti, 90 centimeters of string, 90 centimeters of tape, and one marshmallow. And the marshmallow needs to be on top. And you have to do this in a group within 80 minutes. And it sounds really simple, but it's not always this. And over here you see some students that are actually building the tower. And they look really focused and concentrated. And over here there are some just business people are also doing this workshop and you see over there that the ones on the right are really happy but the one in the middle is not so hopefully they <laughs> they start to come out with something well if i'm looking a little bit more in detail how they actually work to the design process then i found out that they this is how it works often so this is how they start first is our orientating so what do we need to do what is the challenge how much time do we've got and so and if that's clear then they start planning and if they start planning okay we have to make this in this amount of time and you do this i do this and eventually they come up with an idea so they spend a lot of time building it and eventually they start testing and well they're happy with what they made but often this happens. In the end, they had a plan, and they made something, and it didn't work out as planned. So probably there is something that it's not going well within the design process. But if you look more closer to the groups of people who perform well in building a tower, and people that perform really bad at things, then we can see that recent graduate business students actually perform really bad. I'm not sure I know offend someone, but this came out of some research, but who performs well. And then we see that children that are very small actually build the largest towers. And how come? How is it possible that those children are better in building towers with these ingredients instead of most experienced people? So if you ever see the results, they even perform above average. Only one who perform better are the architects and engineers because they have a lot of knowledge about how to build a tower. But if you can see over there, the CEOs, the business students, the lawyers, all perform, yeah, worse, or, but you don't expect them to build better towers. So, so if I could look more into detail about how come that they are better, then we go to the design process. The design process of children is they they don't have the structure, they just start building. So they take the spaghetti, they take the tape, and they start building. And well, while building, they create a tower. And the interesting thing is, so they make a lot of prototypes. And they use the prototypes to explore the unknown, because they're not used of building towers with these ingredients and this material. So they, but they also communicate ideas. So if I build something, the other one says, okay, I can know what, if we do it like this, 
uh, then it becomes better. So it is also kind of inspiration. And eventually, they validate the concept. So they're not in the end, okay, the concept didn't work out, but they know already from the start that the concept that it's in mind works. And this actually, this kind of process we also use at Lego. So we, because we're doing a lot of prototyping, we build stuff every day, every Monday morning, every Tuesday morning, I go to my work and I just pick some Lego and I start building. It's really a hands-on approach. It's a process and it's really quite abortive. So what kind of type of prototyping do we do? From the beginning till the end, we make all kinds of prototypes. It doesn't matter if you start with the working concept in the beginning or we start with the drawings in the end. It doesn't matter how you do it, just build something. And you can do it for different purposes. For example, for the aesthetical reasons, to see how it looks. You can see it for a technical feasibility. Is it proof of concept? Is it a thing that you have tied up? Is it okay? Does it work actually? And how does it interact? And for us, of course, we're making toys. Is it really important that how children interact with it? And eventually it also, for us personally, is the building interface. So how does this new product, uh, yeah, it is being fitted in into a Lego model. So that's quite interesting. But it's a really iterative process that we use and we not have just a fixed one. And we use this kind of with prototyping with all of them. Well, and unfortunately, I cannot tell you a lot about the recent products, uh, projects, but I can show you some quite interesting uh, old ones. And there's quite nice to see how they make use of prototyping and in a real different way. And the first one I want to show you is this, this motor we recently developed. And for you all guys, it looks like just a normal motor, but actually it isn't. Because normally we used to develop these kind of motors. It doesn't look much different, but this is actually an add-on. So you had a model and we added a motor to it. So it was not actually part of the, the, the object, but it was more like a motor that you could add to it. But over here, we started to try to, how could we just change the motor slightly so it becomes actually a structural element. So it becomes a Lego brick instead of a motor, so it becomes two and one. So over here we laid a lot of different type of prototypes and you can see, so we start making prototypes in order to make prototypes. So over here we were searching for ways, how could we just fix the gears to it so it would be the most efficient for integrating this into a model so it would be more easy for them. So prototyping for prototyping, this is a bunch of them. So for testing the interaction, the play experience. So I get actually paid for playing with Lego. And this is also quite a cool project. I brought it with me. And we had this product. It's really old, actually. But we had this product, and you could push some buttons onto it, and it started to make sounds. And one of the engineers, just for fun, started to yeah, attach uh, tilt sensors to it, to the buttons, uh, buttons. And it was just a side project. He didn't intend it to be that it would be made or something like that. It was just for fun. So and if you actually can see. If you have this, you see, it just makes sounds well now. So if I tilt it, it makes different sounds. Very easy, very simple. But he took, I will stop this. He took this to a meeting and he not intended to be that, eventually that he'd do something with it. But it, eventually some of the managers thought, well, that's really cool. So he didn't prepare a presentation. We start to make a product out of it. So a year later, they actually build a product. It's this, it's from Duplo. And you can see, if I, if I tilt it, so from a very simple kind of project that he made, a very simple prototype, actually a new kind of Lego toy was invented. So we started with a working project instead of starting with a drawing. Well, now I want to say a little bit more about my graduation project and that I did for Lego, together with Lego. And it was about integrating smart devices. If you can see the figures over here, smart devices, we all know it, it's become very popular and very big. So Lego ones also try to have some, make use of these kind of devices, but it's quite difficult how we integrate these devices. And of course, they make some kind of app, apps already. This is just, you can build virtual Lego. And this is for the younger one. This is actually one of the most famous and most downloaded. 
but they also try to see how could you make physical like together with smart devices. And I'm not sure who knows this, this is Life of George. Well, not much of you, but I can show you a movie. Probably it's over here. Oh, wait. So I, out by the legal pool, there is Life of George, so you can go out and test them out. This, yeah, it's supposed to work, but there isn't a... I reload this page. Ah. So this is actually the Life of George. Wait. So well, that's the the project we. It's now on the market. So it's the first project that really makes use of um, integrating smart devices and physical Lego play into physical Lego play, and it's one of the first. Only the thing I think it's not cool. It's because it's only available for iPhone. So <laughs> unfortunately, being a big group. But my challenge actually was to integrate smart devices and Lego bricks for four to six year olds and see to. Uh, research to develop uh, developing a new possibilities for those uh, for Lego. So what did I do? Of course, at the beginning, if you start a project, a research project, you start diving into the world of the the, the children, how the, the cognitive development, the physical, and of course, information that you can get out of them. Which also did a lot of research, but you also I did research a lot of about the smart device itself, so technical feasibilities and all things about head usage that were available for me. But there wasn't much information research available about how they interact. So for me, this was my marshmallow challenge. I couldn't get this information somewhere, so I had to build stuff actually in order to get this information. So from there on, I start the first thing I did is actually observing the user. So I developed some apps, really simple apps, just to test some really basic things. Are they able to use the touch screen? Are they able to use objects? How many objects do they, can they handle at once? Can they use the tilt sensor? Can they use the camera? And what way can they use the, uh, the camera? So for me, it was just to get some inspirational data, but also some quantitative data, of course. So I tested this with 60 children, and over here you can see it. And I would just like to just, uh, share with you some cool, um, from my perspective, some cool insights. Children see it, especially that age group, for its product for, uh, for uh, uh, adults, actually. So if you hand them over a phone, they're really careful for with using it. And can I use it? Yeah, you can. So not, of course, every child, but most children still see it as a product for adults. Next to this, children learn quickly. And that's really a nice thing, because you can do something and then just make things, and they just explain it once, and then they adapt to it. So that's also a cool thing. They have difficulties with holding the smart device because these devices are quite big and their hands are really small, and especially if they also have to push something on it with one hand. So it became very hard for them to hold this device. So in that way, if they put it on a table or they put it somewhere, but they didn't really uh, use it. As you see, this girl over here is really, with the balance exercise, it was really challenging for her. 
And of course, it's really important to provide children with a no-fail environment at that period of time. Don't force them with a bus sound if they do it wrong. Provide them with something that it's really encourage them to play and not demotivate them to play, actually. And that was the challenge. So from the, from the research and also the literature research, I came to some conclusions. And from my perspective, you can use a smart device into physical Lego play in four different ways. That's what I thought. You can use the smart device as a Lego brick, so it becomes actually a, a Lego brick itself. You can combine it in a physical, a virtual play, so like augmented reality, for example. You can analyze and enrich, so you can use it next to the playing experience, so it only collects data. Eventually, it does something with it and sends it back to the LEGO model. And you can create and support, and it speaks for itself, so it becomes like a coach, a building tool, some inspiration. So that's my four challenges. From there on, I started to generate ideas and try to test new things. Well, eventually I came up with this concept. This is the early stage of the concept. What you have is that um, you integrate your phone into the Lego object, and the phone is able to recognize, uh, recognize which bricks you're using. And by means of sounds and visualizations on the screen and everywhere, it can adapt. So if, for example, I make a plane, it knows which kind of um, nose I'm using. So this is a fighter jet. So it, changes itself to a fighter jet, put, put on a different nose, an airplane nose, then it knows, okay, I'm a stunt plane, so it becomes that. So, and can, of course, not only be a plane, but it can be everything. It also can be a static object. But when looking a little bit closer to the play experience of children, then you see they build a lot of Lego objects. So it's, for us, it's common that, for example, this uh, is a fire truck, for maybe for the, for the child in their mind, this is a submarine that can kill monsters in deep sea. So from our perspective, it's cool, but for there, it's completely different. So that was kind of a challenge in my exercise. So how to get this information out of the child and get it in. So there's different objects, form, color, function, behavior. So that's all in the mind of the child and I need to get it out. The only deviation I could make was that they made static objects, objects like houses and so on, and factories and farms, and mobile objects, things that could move. That was the only thing that I could say that there was a difference between, and that's very important. That's why I also split up the concept a bit. So, but now, of course, looking more because I'm a technical uh, background, I had to make a prototype. But for me, it was really challenging which technique do I use. So, and I would like to test this interaction. So, in Instead of really focusing, going into that which technique I used, I first would like to see, is this thing, the concept I made, come up with, is this okay? So I had to make a very simple prototype in order to test it. So in this way, I just hooked up my computer, made a program, and I was able to control the phone with my computer. So for me, it was really, able, really simple to make a real-life working prototype, and the children really thought it was working, so but actually it wasn't without spending a lot of weeks and time and effort in developing a real working product that eventually didn't have the same functionality as my Wizard of Oz thing. So now over here you can see some of the photos I took during the tests and it was just the fire track, the concept. So and you put your phone over here on top of the fire uh, brigade and when the car enters the, um, uh, the garage, it notes which car in the garage entered so it's good give you a visual representation and then you could add some things like changing tires and have some animations in order to make the story a bit more yeah bigger for them so and of course at the bottom right you can see that there also had some missions so they have some missions too there was a fire there and there and they had to make to go there so for inspirational purposes but I also developed a concept that was for mobile for more for free play and in this case, I just could build whatever they want, and by means of, uh, and according to what they add to the Lego objects, they could uh, change some things. So the visualization would uh, change, and the sounds would change. But more about that, I will explain later in the presentation. So from those tests, I got a lot of results. Um, it was very important for them to get this inspirational content that I provided by using kind of missions and also the visualizations and the sounds because it activated some type things in the brain so they could even play more. 
Uh, the plug and play interaction was really important because in Lego you just you can add things, add things to it, and then it's change. then it's different. And for the vi for the virtual thing, for the app, it has to be like the same kind of interaction. So plug and play. The enriching of uh, by means of sounds and visualization was also really important. So it was nice to have that. So that it actually worked. Uh, eventually, I came up with a technique of NFC that was most suitable for me for their interaction, but also economically wise for Lego because it needs to be as cheap as possible, of course. Of, of, because and it was the thing that was really interesting was both genders like the concept in one way, and I can, for example, uh, have a really clear example about. What's the difference? Boys especially liked the missions, and they would like to do more missions. So, for example, saving a cat in a tree, then uh, having going to a fire somewhere in the other city, and so on. But girls actually like to play only one type of mission, and especially in my prototype, I had a mission where they had to save a cat, and they played it. I think in one hour, I think they played it 30 times the same mission. But the cat then was there. The cat was over there, so they had to build something different in order to save this cat. So it was quite. Nice to see that both genders was an open solution space for them, so it was not fixed only to be uh, used in one type and really open for them, so they could use their own creativity. Well, and from there on with this information, we event actually made our working prototype, and this is for the static. So what do you do? You buy, just buy your Lego city set, and you just build it, and then you can, in this case, uh, buy the, the add-on set for the fire brigade, and well, what's in there, there's of course extra Lego, the smartphone holder to attach your phone to the object. And of course you need a uh, NFC enabled phone, smartphone, and the tags, the NFC tags. So what do you do? You rebuild your things, easy to integrate. And then you download the app. And when you download the app, you mount, uh, you open it and you put it on top of the, over here on top of the garage. And then you attach the stickers on top of the um, the object, the Lego object in this case. So now when it enters the garage, it notes which what what it was over there, which object you uh, was in there. So it gives a visual representation for them, so they could add extra things to it, filling up the water. And of course, they had different type of missions because some of them really like to get inspirational data. Well, this is for the static object. I also made a final. Um, project uh, prototype for the mobile one. This was a bit more difficult. So you have the same ingredients, so it included the same things. Well, in this case, you just, over here you can see that you have your, your smartphone. It's not really good, but over there you have the smartphone holder, so you can etch that your phone. From there you can start building with it. And in this case, you make a, um, a race car, but you can build whatever you want. It's just free play. You download the app, of course, and now try to get inside the the mind of the child, so it's just this structure, this menu structure was really simple. So what are you making? In this case, in my prototype, they just had three possibilities, because of course you can expand this. And then you choose the color, which color are you using? Luckily with Lego, we just have almost a lot of colors, but mainly we have four or five different colors. And over here you can see if you just choose for the race car, you have some special features, so when moving it, it notes which movements you make and it reacts on that, but you also have some special features to it. And now comes the thing, if you want for the children, it's normal to put a crane on a race car. Why not? But all kind of things is on a race car, it's not only the only functionality. So by using this, uh, those stickers, those uh, NFC stickers, they can assign a function to a specific object and then they can scan it to the phone, so the phone notes what kind of things you add to the to your own creation. And in this case, it was a crane, so it gets a special crane function to it. So it doesn't matter what you have or you want; it's just a free play that you have in order to make this. So you add, you can add a lot of functions to it, and it doesn't matter how much. And well. What this concept does, it supports free play. So from, there was a product actually that a child made, and I'm not sure actually what it can do, but it's a police car that can do something. So it's all in their mind and I really liked it. But in the end, I think the whole story I want to tell is just you can forget everything, but 
thing I want to say is just start building, begin something. Don't hesitate, do something. Just don't, oh, what do I think now? Or what do I want to do? Just make it, even make it with paper, make it with drawing, whatever you are comfortable in. You don't have to use a specific type of prototyping. Just even you can use Lego into prototype. So that's actually the end of my story. That was extremely interesting, Ralph. V thank you very much for sharing so much with You're us. welcome. Let's take some questions. And can we get a mic for Patricia? I just wanted to ask, what did you feel? I mean, you said at the end, build something, but from your point of view, what was the main thing that you learned from going through that process of putting that together? Um, I think, and we had a nice discussion yesterday, and don't force children, let them, don't force them to learn something. Let them be free, let them explore things. Because now, nowadays it's often that, oh, we have to use to learn the mathematics and when they are two years old don't do that let them free let them explore because by means of exploring things they have become confident about themselves and that's reflected in the learning and when you're secure about doing something you actually do it if you're really insecure about doing then you don't do it anymore and especially with the little ones just don't force them to do something just let them be free and this was also a thing i learned there's a very much a Winnicott, and Winnicott would be very proud of you in that message. You know, play is serious business, and children need to do it, so do adults. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> what we know from learning theories is that gaming or playing is simulations, so that's the way we learn. We just forget it. Yeah. Um, and I would say it also a bit sums up what we talked about yesterday uh, at the digital storytelling where we talked about what we call chocolate-covered broccoli that unfortunately been a huge part of the gaming business and educational gaming or, or you could say uh, museums and so where we take something that we actually consider something not nice to eat for a child, covers it in chocolate, say now it's a game, so now you know the Civil War is really interesting and instead we figure out what we should do is put the content there let them play with it and figure out how they want to communicate with a content or thing or object and icon. And that's what we start doing mm. with every kind of gaming or bigger interactive experience. Yeah. And I think it's the same with, for example, the, Hepic, uh, the hacking con uh, competition that's on now and I even heard it because a lot of big corporations are really, when they have some kind of hacking day, they're really impressed about what they can make actually in a few days and even a few hours. So, and they also should start building. And even if they invest a lot of money and time in making something, just doing something actually brings you further in the development. So that's... What I think a lot of the time when we do development, it's actually more for the people who own the content that we do workshops to make them see <laughs> what people really do. <laughs> because the people we want to teach, they get it yeah. much easier. Yeah. We had a question. Uh, sorry. Uh, I, uh, uh, you, say, uh, you say that you should just start building. Uh, before you made the prototypes you have been making, how many ideas did you think about and kill and why? Well, I don't include it into my presentation because I think we will sit uh, till tomorrow morning and even longer because I made a lot of different things and also get a lot of response. But I built a lot of things to just test it. And so, this is, I just showed only one concept, but I have a dozen of them, so that's really cool. And the thing of Lego, you can actually build them right easily. And especially with the mobile phone, there are some really easy ways to just make your own application, and, or just fake it like I did also in, one th in the first iteration. So, in that case. Um, None. Sometimes it just I think I come up with an idea and immediately make a prototype, and sometimes uh, I just rethink it a bit. But often I just if I have an idea I just start making it. Quite easy, simple, and I think oh maybe you can hack some things. Maybe there's already on the market and you just take it apart and use this and fake this interaction. It doesn't matter how complicated it is or draw it on paper and show it others. It depends on what you're wanting out of it. 
in this case, I mean, testing with children, it's really important to make a prototype that, for their perspective, really works. So in this case, I had to make a high-end prototype of, more often. But if you're just testing with adults, sometimes a little drawing on a, on a paper can already do the trick. So I think it's really different from when you're prototyping when you're not an educated designer or educated uh, person who does the science or create uh, experiences. And then if you've never done it before, what Hans is talking about is very normally when creators meet the business side and we have to do something for them that they want to pay for, then we need to run them through a set of options and crystallize them down in a kind of catalog and then decide which of these themes and catalog do we test on. But when we have the amazing ability just to create the stuff with people we put together in a team or if we have half a day and so on, uh, that, then it's another process. So in the end, we of course hope that we can just do that. Yeah. We can sit down prototype ideas, but normally if people can sit down and do that, it's because they do it all the time. So we instinctly know uh, for example, if you never prototype before, you probably will try out 10 things. If I looked at a list of themes, and probably you do, I instantly know two of those. They're really interesting. There are three I'm really in doubt of. There are two ideas I know already while I brush my teeth. We don't spend time, and then maybe we come back to them. So you, if you have the expertise already, you know. And what we talk about in prototyping is putting the right people together around the right themes and test the right things in the themes. So it's very yeah. much about also having that experience. Yeah, and in, in the end, if you make a lot of prototypes and you become more experienced into it, so you know a little bit better what can I do, what will work and what will doesn't work. So in this way, I think, why you should build things. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, I think that uh, with the smartphones, the, um, these days there's a lot more sensors in smartphones than there ever have been uh, sort of in general accessibility. Um, and when you were talking before about integrating the smartphone into the Lego, um, I saw a lot about the visual uh, sensor where they were sensing the, um, the, the, the NFC uh, image and then telling what kind of car it was or anything like that. Now, for, um, for the, the build where you had the, the car or the plane or something like that, did it include other sensors like tilt sensors and things like that, yeah. and motion sensors as well for sounds or um, acceleration? Or yeah. Okay. I just yeah, it included almost every yeah technical thing that you could use to enrich the experience that I used. Yeah, okay. especially the tilt sensor and yeah. the sound. So that was bringing in the old concept as well that uh, your colleague had discussed um, over the 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 smaller uh, prototype that he had made. Yeah. That's yeah, right. yeah. Great. because it works, children like it. <laughs> um, I just want to say very often, as Ralph says, we find out that basic interactions we can actually test with a piece of paper and a person. And, and a lot of the time, as professional prototypes, we actually use Lego also, not to make commercial for Lego, but it's an excellent prototyping tool. Yeah, That's one of our interests of working there, unlimited amount of Legos. <laughs> But you have to live in Billund. Yeah, that's the only disadvantage. But well, <laughs> you have to take one for the team, of course. <laughs> yeah, hi. Uh, I'm just curious about the parents' reaction to this uh, type of uh, using of smartphones. Because many parents I know, they, they are really anti-technology to kids and and I can't think of anyone who would lend them a phone for several hours. Uh, well, I did a lot of tests. I worked a lot of, together with uh, parents because getting information from children is quite hard because often if they think, oh, it's a test, or oh, I have to play, I'm being monitored, they often just say things that it's if, because you like it and they don't mean that they actually mean it. So I worked a lot of, with parents in this case and they were really open for it. But they will lend their new devices for this thing. Is that what you intended with your question? Or? No, I'm just curious if you got a, a lot of um, anger from parents that they shouldn't play with phones, there should be kids. And yeah, there are, there are. That's also, that's also because it was one of the conclusions I showed is that they see it as a product for adults. And that's still a bit, little bit hard that some children, yeah, I, some parents said, no, I don't want my child to play with this smart device. Well. I think personally it's just a matter of time before they start thinking, okay, 
it's just happening. You can don't change it anymore. You can go back and just say, okay, you cannot use it. So it's just a matter of time before they actually accept it. And there are a, a more people, have more parents that really motivate children to play with their uh, with the smart devices. And one of us is over there. It's Tiffany, and she also really motivate that. It's I think that's still the. But what you said is quite interesting. We also have the same discussion within Lego. Is, is it still, is it okay to use smart devices into toys? But we, well. we have a very interesting notion from a lot of uh, interactive uh, exhibitions, especially in museums, and that is that grandparents and children do together. And actually the SMS was something that children developed and did. It was an engineer function in the back of your telephone. So it's children doing emotional language, and that catched on to the grandparents. That was the way they had contact with the grandchildren. So the grandparents were better at mobile phones than the parents, and they were SMSing with their grandchildren. There's a lot of research in this area, especially from Copenhagen University. What we see today is if we create social experiences with children and grandparents, it's very, very effective. And it also facilitates a learning a social um, experience between the generations. Yeah, quick comment regarding the children. Uh, actually, what the, the iPad and the iPhone has right now is the status of a fantastic pacifier like the television, but because it's active, it has a higher degree of value in the minds of the uh, parents. We do a lot of the children's game also, uh, so we've researched quite a bit in this. And actually, in the kindergarten right now, they're rolling out iPads, in Denmark at least, and, and so each kindergarten have like 10 iPads, for the children to, to play with because, well, I more, actually more don't know. Breaks. Yeah. I, yeah, I actually don't know why they're doing it, but they're doing it, and and it means it will become more and more accepted as a children's toy. So uh, there's still a room for doing kids content on the iPad, but it will soon be very swamped. So it's about jumping on the wagon now, so to speak. We take one last question, and then we take a five-minute break and move to the next session. So, uh, last question from for Ralph. Anyone who's burning with a question? Tiffany, you're itching with one, but you're thinking you should let other people ask. So, if nobody else asks, I can see in Tiffany that, that she really wants to ask Ralph something. Well, Ralph and I had a very long discussion last night, and I just want to pick up on two things. Um, the gentleman has asked the question there. I sensed an intonation of, do parents think using smart devices is a, is a good idea. And I know the conversation that we had last night was more about the parents reticent to let their children have their expensive um, uh, products as a toy in case they damaged it. And I just wanted to kind of ar articulate that um, because I sensed that's what you were saying and I know that's the conversation we had last night. A little bit of both, oh, good. Um, well, I'm glad I picked up on at least one of those. And then um, in Denmark, in ch times of uh, giving... Uh, kindergarten our iPads and um, hands saying not, not quite sure why that might be I'd just like to share my personal experience I've got a four year old daughter and since she was two in the first articulation of the iPad um, she's had extensive use of an iPad and um, I'm very fortunate to uh, have that but essentially the learning facilities and the games now on the apps and the way in which that they grow with children's learnings at a very young age is a, a really interesting phenomenon. So um, the question of giving children them at quite a young age is it. <laughs> Maybe it's a sponsored thing. <laughs> Maybe it is. Maybe it's Could be. <laughs> that was Apple all I wanted sponsored? to say, but thank you.